welcome to Bibliophiles Anonymous, episode 11. I'm Denise. And I'm Jess. And we have a really fun show today. Uh, later in the show, we're going to talk about our favorite heroines. All of those great, strong female characters that kick butt and look good doing it. Yep, there's a lot of those so, nowadays. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're going to have fun with this one, I think. But let's start off like we always do and talk about what we're reading this week. Jess, why don't you go ahead? Um, I finished uh, one of the Karen Marie Moaning books, Dream Fever. Yeah, that was it. It's book four. There's only one more left, and I started it. It's Shadow Fever. And I've kind of gotten sucked into these. Fluffy or mm-hmm. not, they've sucked me in, and I've I've got to finish the series. And I'm kind of falling in love with Jericho Barons. Oh, really? He is a total jerk. <laughs> but he's got, he you know, apparently he's pretty to look at, and he's got that whole, you know, confidence thing going on. And, yeah, he's, I'm, I'm in love with him. I Look, I've told you before, I like the bad boys. And I also finished... Uh, Dark Frost by Jennifer Estep, and the exciting thing about that is we have gotten the advanced reader copy of Crimson Frost, which is book four in the series, and we're going to be discussing that on the podcast. Yes, and that is really exciting. Yeah. I'm looking forward to talking about that. We're planning on talking about that in a, in a couple of weeks, so we'll we'll you know do more a little bit later yeah. with that. And I think that's, a, yeah, that's all I've read this week, shockingly. But I have been writing again, so... Well, good. Yeah, that's good. Maybe one day I'll actually get a finished story out of this. Well, hey, it, anything's possible, because, I mean, our listeners probably don't know, but both of us do enjoy writing as well. And I kind of reached a certain groundbreaking moment this week, because I think I have actually completed a rough draft of uh, the novel that I'm attempting to write. Yay! So... Yeah, and I I've never actually completed a writing project before. I've always just kind of started it and then it's trickled away to nothing. Yeah, that's but, kind of the uh, problem I have. But yeah, so now I get to sit back and actually try and revise the stupid thing, and that's going to be a whole other kettle of fish because I've never been able to do that because I've never finished anything. Yeah, proofreaders, so, I'll volunteer. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I have a lot of people that have volunteered, but I would definitely want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> um, but as far as reading, um, I had mentioned last week that I had started reading Gareth the Sorcerer uh, by David Eddings. And I, like I said, I'd read it a lot of times before, but for some reason, and I don't know why, I just wasn't feeling like it right now. And so I think part of it was because there was another series that I've been wanting to reread and I read it earlier this year so I didn't want to start reading it again until I had met my Goodreads goal but since I've already done that I'm going ahead with it and so I started uh, rereading uh, A Song of Ice and Fire by George R.R. R. Martin mm-hmm. and a lot of people know this one because the first book was uh, turned into a mini series on HBO it's called Game of Thrones yes and I haven't actually seen any of it because we don't get HBO and I've just not gotten to see it. I'm guessing it's going to come out on DVD at some point. It, think, it may already be out. Yeah, I, don't I, think, know. I think season one is already out. Is it? Yeah. I, I haven't really even looked yet. But um, anyway, so I'm reading that. And then uh, since we are going to start uh, in a few weeks talking about Crimson Frost, I finished the first book in Jennifer Estep's uh Mythos Academy series, which is uh, Touch of Frost. Mm -hmm. And so I finished that one and uh, really liked it. Uh, It's a a really interesting uh, story world and interesting characters. And I like how she's playing with all the different mythologies. Yeah, I like that. So, um, but we'll talk again. We'll talk more about that when we actually discuss the the book. But I am, like I said, I finished book one, which is A Touch of Frost. And then I am... Uh, working on book two, which is Kiss of Frost, and really liking it so far. I imagine it's kind of dinky having it set up there in your neck of the woods, too. It was kind of funny, although um, it, it's set in Asheville, North Carolina, which is probably a three- or four-hour drive. So they're talking about, like, you know, this kind of quirky downtown area that it's got and all the mountains and everything, and I'm like, yep, yep, I, I know that part of the country quite well actually (laughs) so that was kind of funny 
Yeah, those are really good. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading Crimson Frost, and I'm excited that I get to read it before it's actually released. I know. That that, that, that was a really exciting thing, and we, we've got another uh, ARC that we're going to talk about um, probably in a couple of months because it's not coming out for a while, but... Um, I'm really, I'm really excited that you got us signed up and yeah. involved in all of that because it's going to be a lot of fun uh, talking about all these new books that are coming out. Well, and we I'm, can find more about new books that are coming out. Yeah, this way. I mean, I'm glad that publishers have started doing this because I mean, before it's always been so hard to get print ARCs because they're so expensive to make mm-hmm. that they actually cost more to print the ARCs than it does to print the actual final version of the book. Right, which doesn't sound like it should be a problem, but it is. Yeah, and I mean, so they don't print a lot of them, and they try to, you know, give them, most of them, I think, usually go out to other authors. Because, you know, you see, when you buy a book, even a new release, it has these taglines on it from other authors that have done their reviews of the book. Right. So I think most of the ARCs go out, the print ones go out to people like that. So it was hard for people like us on a podcast or bloggers to get their hands on them. Right. But enter the digital age, you've got digital ARCs that cost practically nothing to make, and it's a lot easier for bloggers and reviewers like us, small outfits like us that aren't, you know, we're not widely known, to get these ARCs, which is extremely exciting for me because... You know, I, I'm getting, I've found quite a few books on there that are, that I've heard of. I was afraid when I signed us up, I'm like, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to sign us up for this and I'm going to browse this catalog and it's going to be all stuff that are from publishers I've never heard of, from authors I've never heard of, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I'm sure th- no. there'll be great stuff on there either way. But when I got in there and I saw names like Random House and Del Rey and Tor, I was right. like, wow, we've hit pay dirt. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 really exciting, and it's going to be a way for us to kind of stay on top of some things that are going on in the publishing world, at least in a small way. Yes. So we we'll, we can hear about some new books that are coming out, both that are you know part of a series like this one, and I know that the other one that we were approved for, I think it's either the first book in the series or it might be a standalone i'm not sure i think it's the first in the series and and just so you know yes we are doing book four in a series for our first one we're gonna try not to make a habit of jumping into the middle of series like that yeah this one's gonna be kind of a a special case yes but i think we are going to talk about the series as a whole a bit Um, because you have to if you're going to talk about book four you're going to have to you can't just jump in there and say oh yeah this really was cool when you know, nobody else has any kind of context for it. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. Yeah, well, that's but that's all I've read um, this past week. This past week has been just kind of insane work-wise for me, both with the writing and then my actual day job. So I haven't had as much time to read as I would like. But yeah, some weeks are like that. Yeah, I saw your post on Facebook about drowning your sorrows in Ghirardelli peppermint bark. I. I still have the bag sitting right here on my desk. (laughs) So if you hear any munching or crunching, that's just me having another peppermint bark. It's one of the things I love about this time of year because all of the, like, chocolate and mint stuff comes out. Yeah. It's probably my favorite one. And, you know, the thing about it is peppermint bark is so easy to make yourself. And yet I have never done it. (laughs) (laughs) I did. I did. One year for Christmas, all of my friends, I didn't buy them things I cooked them things Mm -hmm. and I asked them I was like what do you want and my best friend told me she wanted peppermint bark so I made her peppermint bark I made somebody ginger snaps I made somebody I tried to make divinity for somebody but it's hard to make divinity work down here because it's so humid oh yeah yeah so it's really touch and go I didn't end up with divinity I ended up with sticky puffy mess is what I ended up with (laughs) And I made uh, the most amazing chocolate, chocolate chunk cookies. Oh, God. That were surprisingly easy. And I used Ghirardelli chocolate for them. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, they were awesome. Yeah. And then I actually cooked dinner for them. I made white chicken chili. So that was my... Okay, so if you want to send me any kind of like good <laughs> treats, you are welcome to do so. <laughs> um, I don't know about that, but I will send you the recipe for the cookies. Okay, yeah, I'll, that'll work. Because, like I said, they were surprisingly easy to be easy made. Easy's good. To be made from scratch like they were. And 
I do have to say, though, if you use good chocolate, the cookies will be better. Okay. So that's why I use I Ghirardelli. Because Ghirardelli makes the baking stuff now. Yeah. They have the bags of chocolate chips. You need uh, semi-sweet chips, milk chocolate, and white chocolate chips. And uh, next time I make them, I'm adding macadamia nuts. Ooh, that does sound good. Yeah. So enough about cookies. <laughs> enough about cookies and about all of the types of foods that I want to eat when I get stressed out. All right. <laughs> Let's move into our main discussion. It started off actually as a top 10 blog post. Uh, this blog, it's a community blog called The Broke and the Bookish, which I love the title to start with. Yes. And it was founded by a group of college students who all loved to read, but they all had no money. So, hey, they, would review, <laughs> so they would review books, but, and they would also talk about, like, kind of how they found books, either like through yard sales or some from used bookstores or things like that, different ways that you could get them like really inexpensively. So they started a weekly feature called Top 10 Tuesday. And now people all over the, you know, literary blogosphere join in on this and uh, they have a list of topics and on Tuesdays, a whole bunch of other bloggers decide to join in, and they'll link up their own top ten list to the Broke and the Bookish. And so this was several, when, when did they do this? It was no, about a month ago. And the exact title of the list was your top ten favorite kick-ass heroines. And so that was a really fun one to go through because sometimes I have a hard time coming up with ten things. And, you know, that's fine. Sometimes I'm having to have a top five or a top eight, but this one was actually pretty easy yeah. because I found out when I went back to to college that I'm actually quite the little feminist <laughs> and I was really drawn to, and not just in fantasy or, you know, sci-fi or any of the other genres that I follow, but pretty much all aspects of literature, I was always drawn to the really feisty, independent female characters. Yeah. For example, uh, one of the ones that I put on my list on the blog post was Jane Eyre. And I first read Jane Eyre when I was a senior in high school um, by Charlotte Bronte. And just for the record, Charlotte Bronte and all of the Bronte sisters are also pretty darn feisty and impressive. But I loved that you know, Jane was born into this time period where you didn't have a whole lot of choices when you were a woman and she was an orphan besides and didn't have any money so she had poverty and she had her gender kind of in her way and she didn't care she set out to make a life for herself she fought for the things that she wanted and for the man that she loved. And I was just so impressed with her, even when I was, you know, 17 or 18 and had nothing in common with her at all, because, you know, obviously nowadays women can pretty much aspire to whatever they want. Yeah. But I just, she was not willing to take no for an answer. And I thought it was really interesting because, of course, we were studying the authors a bit, too, since I was studying it for a class. And back when the Bronte sisters were writing, uh, it was very uncommon for women to be published. Because if a woman was writing, it was just supposed to be kind of considered, oh, it's a silly little hobby. They're writing silly little things. So they all decided they were going to get published anyway. And they would pick these either masculine sounding or kind of unisex pen names. Yeah. And they'd publish their stuff anyway. <laughs> Hey. And for the and for a, and for a long time, nobody knew that they were women. They they just assumed that uh, Charlotte Bronte's pen name was Kerr C U R R E R. I think it was spelled so Kerr, and then the last name Bell. And nobody had any idea that that was a, a woman writing. And so I'm just like, you know, you go Charlotte Bronte. Yeah. Don't let them tell you you can't write. You keep on writing. And I thought that was awesome. And so you know, there's there's my my first pick for for. A, Feisty, independent heroine. Probably my favorite, and she's one of my favorite characters, not just one of my favorite female characters, is Merritt from uh, Chloe Nail's Chicago Land Vampire series. Okay. She is uh, 27, I believe. She is an undergrad student in Chicago, and she is turned to a vampire without her consent. 
Because the way things are set up in that universe, you have to apply to become a vampire. Oh, okay. Yeah, they can't just go out and turn people willy-nilly. Um, but she's attacked on campus by a vampire. And this other vampire, which happens to be the master of one of the three vampire houses in Chicago, comes along and the only way he can save her life is to turn her into a vampire. So he does. Which pisses her right off, let me just tell you. <laughs> She is just, she totally just flies off because she was changed without her consent. But she is, uh, her, she has a wealthy family. Her, her last name is actually Mary. You don't find out until like book four, five, maybe, what her first name actually is. But her family, the Merritts, they're new money, Chicago. Uh-huh. And she doesn't really like her dad or her mom. She tries to distance herself from them. She loves her grandfather, though. Her grandfather was blue-collar. He was a cop. You know, he wasn't obsessed with material things like her parents were. Right. And uh, after she's turned, she has to... Vampires can only have one name, unless they're a master. Master vampires can have a first and last name. So she just goes with merit, because that's what everybody called her anyway. But she's one of those characters who she thought she was strong, but she finds out that she's a lot stronger than she ever thought she could be. Uh-huh. And, I mean, she's just badass, and she does it in leather and carrying a katana. I mean, you know. <laughs> and, you know, she, look, she's badass enough that she turns the master vampire's head. You know, he's been around for hundreds of years, and she's got enough spunk that he falls for her. So, and I love him, too. I mean, well, that's, that's something there, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned him in the, you know characters we fall in love with ethan sullivan oh i love him so yeah she's she's just one of my favorite female characters period she's one of my favorite characters period i love her. she's sassy and she's kind of a smart ass mm-hmm. which i like because i'm kind of a smart ass <laughs> and like i said she she's just awesome well one of my favorite female characters of all time if we're going to you know, talk about those. And I think that she was on your, probably on your list as well. And that is Hermione Granger. Yes. From the Harry Potter series. I don't think I and, actually, put her, actually put her on the list when I did the blog post, but uh-huh. she would definitely be on there. Well, and see, the reason that I like her so much is because basically she is me when I was in school. I was always had my head in a book. I was always heading to the library. And if you're if you're looking for just a really smart in 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 many different ways. I mean not just book smarts, but she's got a ton of common sense, which let's face it, those boys needed a good dose of common sense. Oh yes, they did. And well they're boys. Well, true. But you know, she they don't call her the brightest witch of her age for nothing. Right. She is you know, vastly intelligent, logical, and on top of that, she can also, you know, kick some butt. Yeah, she can and hex you in the next Tuesday if she wants to. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's probably pretty much accepted that, you know, Harry Potter would not have defeated Voldemort without a lot of help, and she was the one who did a lot of the helping. Right. Just with the amount of information that she had and the way she was helping, well, with everything, but gathering the information and letting him know different things and being a big support as well. Yeah. Especially in book seven when Ron decides that he's going to go off and sulk for a while. Yeah. Well, I know on the tavern, we started this, we started a discussion on the tavern about this topic last week. And um, the person that I, one of the people that I actually mentioned, Hermione, Marita, she asked, would she count as a heroine? And I think with Harry Potter, you can't really separate Harry, Ron, and Hermione and say, well, Harry's the hero. Because I think right. they're all equally important. Yes. You know, yeah, it was, Harry was the main character, but he couldn't have done what he did without Ron and Hermione. Right. It was the teamwork between those three that made their victory possible. Right. So in that and, part, I think that Hermione very much qualifies as a heroine. Oh, I agree. <laughs> and I even put on my, on my blog post that, you know, not only does she, like, try and take care of everyone and take care of her friends, but who didn't cheer when she slapped Draco Malfoy yes. at the face? Yes. I was like, yeah, you you go, girl. I wanted, I wanted to slap his sorry little face, too. <laughs> yeah. I think in the movie she actually punched him, though, didn't she? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
that worked too. Yeah, it's something, anything. That, that it was, was a, it was a change from the original story that I was okay with. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> you know, we we discussed this on our uh, episode about book to movie adaptation. Some things you have to translate differently for a screen than you would in a book, and I think a punch was more effective. Oh yeah. In that in in that case. <laughs> but yeah, Hermione's awesome. I keep telling people that one year I'm going to go as Hermione for Halloween because I have this hair that if I don't flat iron it, it has a mind of its own. <laughs> and I can let it dry and then brush it, and it's totally got the Hermione thing going on. See, I was thinking about trying to be a Harry Potter character for Halloween this year, but I couldn't be Hermione because everything that I have that's Harry Potter related is Ravenclaw. Because I always get, when I do like any of like the you know, little quizzes online and stuff, they always sort me into Ravenclaw, and, and I actually probably that's where it would fit in anyway, but, you like, know, since Hermione's a Gryffindor, I couldn't, I'd have to get all new stuff. See, I've always been sorted into Gryffindor, so, even well, the official fine, you know. Pottermore, the official set up by J.K. Rowling sorting put me in Gryffindor. Yeah, and it put me in Ravenclaw. <laughs> You know, with with your dark hair and glasses, you could be Moaning Myrtle. Oh, I don't want to be Moaning Myrtle. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That you would just have to be, you know, Ravenclaw girl. Well, I, I, I mean, I do get depressed from time to time, but I think being Moaning Myrtle is a little bit too much. Yeah. Well, I always, I joked around that for Halloween, if I was going to be a, a Harry Potter, like, character, a Hogwarts character, that I was going to be Ravenclaw extra number three. Hey, there you go. But Hermione was awesome. She, look, Harry and Ron, I love them, but there's just so much that they couldn't have accomplished without her. No, definitely not. But anyway, another one, so another one that uh, both of us have read, I think you're in the process of reading about, that I had put on my blog post list was uh, Megan Chase from the Iron Face yes. series. And I just, I I really liked her because she was, again, she was somebody who was very down to earth, who was kind of forced into this crazy situation and, you know, is finds out that she's half human, half fairy, finds out that her little half brother has been kidnapped by the fae and doesn't even really stop to think about it. She just heads into the Never Never with all of this threatening horrible stuff that's attacking her and surrounding her and she just goes out there and she says i'm gonna find my brother and i'm gonna bring him home and that's it no yeah. ifs ands or buts <laughs> she just decides that it's her job and she's gonna do it yeah and there's so many different things that are thrown at her and don't even get me started with her relationship with ash oh uh, i'm gonna because f- i had such a love-hate relationship with him and her throughout the whole series yeah um, Until the end, and I would the ending worked things out okay, but I was just oh he he was so frustrating to me and what he kept putting her through and she, yet she was still so strong that she even though she was sad when he was being a jerk she was still focused on what she needed to do and kind of tried to rise above it yeah yeah like I've I've only read the first two I will read book three and four I will you need to. I haven't managed to read any of my library books, so I may just, and they're due back and forth, so I may just take them back and not bother with them. Well, I did read one of them. I read The Crimson Crown, but the other four, no, never read them. So I may well, just... See you, see, you have to get to book four in this series because, okay, books one through three were all told first person from Megan's point of view. Yeah. Book four is told first person from Ash's point of view. Yes, I have to read book four. So it, it's completely different, and you finally see what's going on inside his head, which is keeps being a mystery back and yeah. forth between her, and she doesn't know what he's thinking, if he loves her back, if he doesn't, and... Yeah, it's enough to make you want to slap him silly sometimes. Yes. It's like, it, what you are you doing? Yes. Yes, that that was a problem I had with them the, through the whole thing. But again, that was one thing that really made me impressed with Megan is because even though she had all these feelings for him, she didn't let that stand in her way of doing what needed to be done. Yeah. Whether it was rescuing her brother, whether it was fighting the Iron Fae, 
even though she, she she wasn't one of those lovesick female characters who was just like, I don't have my man, so I'm just, life isn't worth living kind oh, of a God, thing. Oh, God, I, I mean, can't stand those. I mean, she wasn't happy, and she wished things were different, but she still took care of business. Right. So that's why I liked her. Oh, speaking of characters who decide something is their job and they're going to do it, Another one of my favorite kick-ass heroines is uh, Carolyn from Mercedes Lackey's series, Heralds of Aldemar books. Actually, she has her own book, uh, By the Sword. And what I've actually read that one. You have? Yay! I, I think so, yeah. I, I remembered her name, and then you said that title, and I've actually read that one. She, um, her family is attacked at the feast for her brother's engagement. Yes. And her brother is killed and her father is injured or her father is injured and her, her father is killed and her brother is injured. I can't remember. One of them's dead and one of them's hurt. And uh, her up-and-coming sister-in-law is kidnapped. Well, there's no one left uninjured or alive that can go rescue her. So Carolyn decides that it's her job to do it. Since, you know, her father's hurt, her brother's dead, they can't go after her. So she takes it upon herself and she goes and talks to her grandmother who's a sorceress named Kathy, who is also one of my favorite badass females. <laughs> Mercedes Lackey writes a lot of those. Her grandmother gives her this sword named Need, and Carolyn takes off and rescues her sister in or up at her, you know, soon to be sister in law and gets chosen in the process. And I love the fact that she'd never really been trained. She'd never really had any experience doing anything like that, but she had this enormous sense of responsibility that somebody had to do it, and she was the only one who could. And I love the way she deals with Need. Need is a sword, and they think that it's a spell blade, and whoever bears it, you have to go off rescuing every damsel in distress within a 100-mile radius. And the sword, it, it, it helps you too, because if you are a mage, it gives you fighting skills. If you are a fighter, it protects you from magic. And uh, Carolyn tells the sword several times, I'm not going to do that, and if you don't stop trying to make me, I'm going to throw you down a well. <laughs> I mean, I love the way she deals with Need, and, and Need is actually very important later on in Mercedes Lackey's books when you find out what she really is. But uh, I've always I've always loved Carolyn, and I loved Kethry. She, her, she had her own series. There was three books, The Vows and Honor, she was kind of a badass heroine, too. She had a sword, a sword sworn sister, that's hard to say, <laughs> who was from uh, the Shinayan tribe, which the, I think the reason I like the Tarma and Kethry book so much and like Tarma and Kethry is because Tarma is Shinayan, and she's really the only Shinayan that Mercedes Lackey has written a lot about like that because they're sort of a mysterious kind of thing with the Shinayan. But all of all of Mercedes Lackey's female characters are incredibly strong and they're just she's very good at writing them. Mhm. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read very many Mercedes Lackey books. Uh I I want to because I've heard a lot of people, you included, who have recommended them to me, but I did read By the Sword. I remember it because I it was a library book that I took on a vacation because yeah. I knew I was going to have a lot of free time to read. And so, yeah, Carolyn was a really fun and interesting character. Yeah, I think she actually ends up uh, becoming the weapons master of the Herald's Collegium. Oh, really? If I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, and for those who haven't read or heard of Mercedes Lackey, people get chosen by these things called companions. Companions are horses. They're all white, they all have sapphire blue eyes, and they all have silver hooves. They're not actually horses, but I'm not going to tell you what they are because that kind of becomes important in the book. you got to figure that one out for yourself. But she gets chosen while she's in the midst of trying to save her soon-to-be sister-in-law. Uh-huh. And she's... I like Carolyn. She's a lot like me in the sense that this doesn't make any sense. I don't want to do it. That, that crops up with her a few times. She's, like, very, very, very opinionated. And so you identify with her why? Well, because I'm very, very, very opinionated. <laughs> I have opinions, and I will share them with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> just just have a mask, or not. Hey, you know, <laughs> you don't have to ask. Though, if you do oh. ask for my opinion, be prepared for the truth. <laughs> I don't sugarcoat it. All right, well, another uh, 
heroine that I know both of us have read about. Uh, you read about it before me, I know, because when I was reading through the whole series, you commented on Facebook saying, wow, you're going through these really fast. And especially since the movie came out this past year, I think we have to mention Katniss Everdeen yes. from The Hunger Games. Okay. I don't even think I need to go through why. All you have to do is see the movie poster, and you can tell why yeah. she's on this list. She is... I think she's just an amazing character all around. And, you know, her father is killed in a mining accident, and her mother just kind of retreats inward and is unable to deal with everything because of her grief. So before anything in the Hunger Games series even happens, Katniss is already taking care of her whole family, her mom and her sister, breaking the law in order to do it because of where they live, being just in the midst of this poverty and sneaking past the borders of their district to go hunting she's deadly with a bow yes which is another thing that makes her awesome yes i love archers yeah and she's very good at it but the thing is is like not only is she so strong and capable and independent but she's also got this softer more compassionate side to her like, the relationship that she has with her sister. Yeah. And, you know, she's always trying, even within the Hunger Games, and I don't think it's possible for very many people not to know what happens in the Hunger Games, but basically you have all of these young people between the ages of 12 and 18 who are put down in this very, you know, realistic arena, and they fight to the death until one person remains. Mm-hmm. And... You know, even though she's in this fight-to-the-death situation, she still takes care of people. Like, the the youngest person in there is a girl named Rue, and she's only 12. And, you know, her and Katniss become friends, and Katniss helps her and takes care of her until, you know, unfortunately she's killed. Mm -hmm. And even though, in the book more so than the movie, she has uh, the boy from her district named Peta, there's a part of the book through a lot of the book, actually, where you're not exactly sure what his motives are because he had mentioned that he might have had a crush on her at one time, but then it looks like he's conspiring against her with these other tributes in the game. Yeah. But she still seeks him out and helps him when he's injured and really close to death. So, you know, she has this compassionate side, and sometimes, and I don't understand why, but a lot of times that compassionate side in women is kind of seen as a weakness. Yeah, and it's not. No, not at all, because you think it was easy for her to do all of those things and take care of all those people? Absolutely not. But that combination of being strong and yet compassionate is one of the things that I think really makes Katniss you know, an interesting character. Well, she's she's real. She's human. I mean, mm-hmm. she doesn't she's not one dimensional. You know, she's no. there there's there's many layers to the onion that is Katniss. <laughs> yes. You know, and and it it makes her a very realistic character. I mean, she's she's definitely mature beyond her age, but when you live the life that she lives in the place that she lives and you lose your father like that and you become responsible for your whole family, then you have to gain that maturity. Right. I mean, you're left with no choice. And I think in some ways she probably would have anyway because even when she had, you know, both of her parents alive and functioning um you know they were still not in the best of situations so i think even if she you know still had her father i think she would still be going out and trying to find food the way that she did and it wasn't just even just to to feed her family but she would take it and sell things on the black market in order to try and trade either for other commodities that they needed or for extra money But, like you said, she's a very real character. She was very down-to-earth, very focused on what she needed to do. And she was determined, even though she was an underdog going into it, knowing that, you know, tributes from Districts 1 and 2 were training for this their entire lives and could probably easily take her down, she still went into the games saying, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to win because I have to to take care of my family. Right. Whereas if you know, I was going through that situation. I would curl up in a little ball and cry and wait to be killed. Probably. Yeah, I probably would too. 
yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I could not handle that. And I know she's, you know, a fictional character and of course she can be written however she needs to be, but she's just a very, very strong person. Definitely. And that's why she is awesome. She, like I said, I'm with you. If, uh, if I was thrown into a situation like that where it was fight to the death, I would just be a quivering mass of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and now for something that's not young adult or fantasy. Okay. Um, I've mentioned before that I read all of the in-death books by J.D. Robb. Uh-huh. And Eve Dallas, the protagonist in those books, is a, she's a kick-ass heroine, too. She's a... She's a lieutenant in the New York City Pol- uh, Police and Security Department is what it's called in the books because it's in 2060. So apparently they added the and security okay. on there. She's a lieutenant. But what makes her so amazing is her background and the history of what she overcame to get where she is. When she was eight years old, she killed her father because not only was he raping her, he was letting his friends rape her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was horrible. So she managed to get a hold of a knife, and she murdered him when she was eight years old. Wow. And uh, her mother never had anything to do with her. Her mother never cared about her. So she was put into foster care. Mm-hmm. And she never had a name. Her parents never named her. They just, you know, called her the kid. And uh, she didn't have a birth certificate because she wasn't born in a hospital. So all of this took place in Dallas, Texas. So when she went into the foster care system, they named her Eve Dallas. And she grew up and she moved to New York and she went through the police academy and she became a lieutenant. And she's a homicide detective. And when the series first began, she's still dealing with a lot of nightmares <clears throat> she has these nightmares about what happened with her father and all the things that she had went through i mean she still hadn't completely dealt with it and right. as the series progresses and she well she meets her husband in the first book and a lot of the stories talk about her dealing with her past and facing these nightmares and trying to overcome the problems they cause her And finally, in one of them, she actually goes back to Dallas to where everything happened because, you know, she finally decides that she's ready to kind of face that part of her past. But she's such a self-sufficient type of person. Like, she doesn't want to depend on anyone, and she doesn't want anyone taking care of her. Uh That when her and Rourke get married, it, it at first, it just really, really bothers her when he tries to do nice things for her. Uh Uh-huh. And... But eventually she starts to soften up a little bit and she, and she finally realizes that he understands her like nobody else can. Mm-hmm. But she's, like I said, she overcomes a lot to become, to get where she is. And not only, I mean, she's a lieutenant, but she's like one of the most successful homicide detectives in the police department. I mean, she's, she's just awesome. I love her. And she's, she's one of those characters that it's not that, she doesn't understand love. It's that she doesn't understand how people can love her. Right. And and she sort of starts coming to terms to that after her best friend has a baby and the baby just loves her. But she's one of those people that she's like, she's holding this baby and she's like, what should I do with this thing? You know, it's, it's, it's really <laughs> funny. It, it's, there's funny parts in there that they're just really good books. And she's just, she's just a really, she's another one of those that she's just a really, really strong human being i mean to overcome what she did and to make it to where she did i can't even imagine right no and i think there's there's plenty of uh these strong female characters who have something that they have to overcome and that's one of the things that really makes them interesting but also gives them the tools that they need to become these really strong independent women yeah i mean you know i consider myself fairly independent and strong and I know I'm hard-headed and I'm very willful, but, you know, some of these people overcome things that I can't even imagine. It's like, I just, I would turn into a quivering bowl of jello in that situation. <laughs> oh, I would too. So, um, I wanted to go over and pull some of the, some of the people that were mentioned over at the tavern, uh, because there was, there was one that was 
um, mentioned over there, and it was also on my list too. And she's also had a couple things to overcome, although not quite as as serious as as Eve went through. But uh, it's Lessa from Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern series. See, I haven't read those. They're on that list of things I'm going to read eventually. You have to, because they are basically classic literature for anybody who reads fantasy. And there's dragons. Yes, so dragons are all I know good. how you are about dragons. And these dragons are done properly. They don't have feathers. Yay! <laughs> At least I don't think so. But the main thing that you need to know about Lessa is that she lives in this, well, I don't know exactly how to describe them, but it's kind of almost like a little city-states that are throughout the, the land of Pern. And hers was attacked and taken over by basically a dictator. And all of her family's been killed. She somehow escapes and hides. And now she's a child when this happens. And so she stays in hiding in order to one day get her revenge. Hmm. That's, her, that's her whole plan. You know, hide in the hold until she can figure out a way to get revenge on this dictator guy who's taken over and killed her family. So that's what she does. She also has some um, magic powers that she doesn't really know how to focus because she's never been taught. She's never really had anyone to talk to about them. And she stays disguised as kind of a servant, kind of a drudge. And so she's always filthy dirty and, you know, by the time she starts getting older, even people who knew her probably wouldn't recognize her. Mm -hmm. She gets her chance to try and attack the dictator guy because he's visiting all of these places that he's taken over and he's coming there. And she has basically made sure that even though he owns this particular holding, she has sabotaged it so much that he's not getting a single bit of income from it. He's not getting anything from it because it's basically falling apart. Oh. And, you know, he's not happy about that. And she's like, yeah, that's right. That's what I'm going to do. And she tries to go after him during one of the times the, the land of Pern has uh, dragon riders. And they're supposed to protect the land of Pern from this. I don't even know exactly how to describe it. it it's called Thread. And it rains down from the sky, and it burns everything it touches. And the only way to fight it is to burn it before it hits the ground, and that's what the dragons do. But it hasn't happened for a really, really, really long time. The dragon population has been dwindling, and most people kind of think that it's never going to come back and the dragons aren't even needed anymore. But they go around whenever there's going to be a hatching, and they look for likely candidates to create this bond each dragon has a special um, telepathic connection with a specific dragon rider and they get that when they hatch and so they go around looking for likely people who might bond with this, these dragons so let actually uses the dragon rider and kind of plants the idea in his mind because that's one of her magic things she can do to basically call out the dictator and challenge him to a duel yeah because she can't do it because she's I mean, basically malnourished and everything else. But she goes after him, and where the dragon rider figures it out, and he's none too happy with her. Well, I would guess not. No, but, you know, eventually the dictator guy is killed, and Les is like, all right, you know, this place, it's mine. I am the last person of the blood who lives here. So Ruatha Hold is my place. It is my home, and nobody else can have it. And basically, the dragon rider, whose name is Flar, he's like, you're not staying here. You are coming with me to see if you can impress on this queen dragon that's getting ready to hatch. Because, you know, you've got, you've got the kind of qualities that we need to help, you know, bring dragon riders back into prominence again. Yeah. And, of course, that's what happens. But... The, the thing with her is that she came from basically having absolutely nothing, being the lowest of the low, and then becomes the dragon rider of the queen dragon of Pern. So 
she's another one that's just like really, really strong. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, if I, if my home or my city or my whatever was attacked and my entire family killed, I don't know if I would be capable of waiting patiently until I could strike back. Yeah. I would just be a sobbing, blubbering, pathetic mess. And less that she has that one very strong, very clear plan. It's not even a plan, but it's more a goal. That that's what she's going to do. She is going to get her revenge and take back her city, her holding, whatever you want to call it. And that's basically what she does, although it doesn't quite work out the way she expects it to. <laughs> Those but, things usually don't. Well, you know, but it's okay because what she ends up doing ends up being quite a bit better. And I'm not, she does a really big, huge thing at the end of the book. This is all happens like at the very beginning of the book. But yeah. She does a really big, huge thing, like save the world type thing at the end of the book. And I'm not going to go into that. But you definitely need to read them because anybody who is a fantasy fan and has not read them, uh, well, they need to read them. Yeah. Well, you know, I have a reading list that's longer than my lifespan, so maybe one day. Yeah, I know. I do, too. <laughs> it, it's on there. It's on the list. I'm going to read them eventually. And and another reason I'd really like to read them is that, like, Anne McCaffrey and Andre Norton both, I know, when Mercedes Lackey first was starting out as an author, they both kind of took her under their wing mm-hmm. and and helped her. And taught her how to make a marketable product out of her writing. So, you know, as much as they influenced her, I would almost have to like Anne McCaffrey. Well, and the thing is, too, once you start reading the Pern series, there's a blue million of them. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of like Mercedes Lackey. Well, yeah, and maybe that's where Mercedes Lackey got the idea. Because once you had all of these main characters in place... Anne McCaffrey just, like, started taking all of these secondary characters and writing their stories. And then taking another character and writing their story. (laughs) That's kind of what Mercedes Lackey done. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and so you end end up, I think the main, there's maybe five books in the first main series. And I don't think you have to read them in any specific order. I think the first one I read, I think, was Master Harper of Pern. And that's somewhere in the middle. Or actually, I think it's a almost like a prequel because it's the backstory of a character that's already, you know, full grown and kind of doing his thing once, once Lessa and all them come around, but no, they're all really, really good. And it's a really interesting fantasy world. That's kind of, well, like I said, that that's probably where Mercedes Lackey got the idea because I know like she started, the first series she wrote was the Eros books. Mm-hmm. And you had Talia and Skiff, and then there was Queen Selene and her daughter, Ta- uh, Elspeth. And then later she writes Take a Thief, which is Skiff's story. And then the Mage Winds and Mage Storms trilogy, Elspeth plays a big role in those. And, I mean, it, that's kind of what she did. You know, she would she would create a character that was kind of a secondary character, and they would end up getting their own story. Uh-huh. Like, well, the weapons master before Carolyn was Alberic, and he was from Kars. And eventually she writes his story of how he was chosen and how he became the weapons master. So, I mean, it's these incidental characters that she introduces that people are like, I want that story. So she would write it. And she probably learned that from Anne McCaffrey. Probably, yeah. We haven't even scratched the surface of the ones that are mentioned in the tavern. I know... Uh, Lensman had oh lord he had a whole bunch of them yeah he had let's let's just uh, name a couple of them um, he had Anita Blake from the Laurel Hamilton series I, I think there's a couple of them there's um, quite a few of those a friend yeah. of mine reads them uh, he did had until she kind of got like him and they turned into you know erotica and he gave up well um, he had uh, Thursday next for uh, by Jasper Fjord. Yeah, those Ford. Ford. Those um, I like Thursday too. She's pretty good. Uh, he had a lot of actually a lot of uh, characters he mentioned from Game of Thrones. I do agree. Uh, this would probably be the youngest one on the list, and that would be Arya, who's I mean she's just a child, but she's one of those female children who don't want to 
be forced into like a female stereotype. She yeah. wants to learn how to sword fight. She wants to learn how to, you know, ride horses and she doesn't want to sit around doing needlework all day and just be stuck in pretty uncomfortable dresses. She wants to go out there and, you know, be a rough and tumble kid. And so she does. That reminds yeah. me a lot of uh, Raisa from the Seven Realms by Cinda Williams Chima. Yeah. I I actually really grew to like Raisa a lot by the end of that series because she but... she sort of... I know there's one scene in the books where she's actually trying to do the needlework and she throws her hoop across the room because she's like, I can't do this. Yeah, actually, I believe Arya has kind of a similar scene. <laughs> she's she's just, she's not a girly girl and she refuses any attempts to try and make her into one. And um, there's there's been several char- female characters who have done this, but there is a point where she basically disguises herself as a boy and this is partially a way to survive because this is after um a whole bunch of really bad things have happened to everybody in the kingdom not just to her but so trying to pretend to be a boy is kind of a a survival technique as much as it is kind of what she really wants and she's she's just for a little girl she is really strong and that's she's she's an impressive character anybody who's read that series i know a lot of people who have read that series and she's always on the list of favorite characters but let's see let's see who else uh who else lensman had said a lot of these that he mentioned i don't know them yeah there was a lot of them that i didn't either um he mentions uh angelina from the stainless steel rat novels i'm not sure who they are uh Jiral of Jory by C.L. Moore. I have heard that name before, but I had never read the character. He also mentioned Sabriel by Garth Nix, which is actually a a book club book yes. that's going to be coming up in a few months. So I guess we will find out exactly what's going on with her. Yep. Um, Charis Nordholm from Ordeal and Otherware by Andre Norton. Um, Jackie from The Anubis Gates by Tim Powers. He wrote, not sure if she counts since she's disguised as a boy throughout the book. Well, Arya does that too, so I say it counts. Yeah. Um, we had quite the discussion about whether or not Hermione counted, and we all finally agreed that uh, she does. Hey. Um, she does to me. Uh, me too. Uh, Vector actually mentions uh, briefly, he didn't say her specifically, but he did mention Sinedra from the Belgariad series. And I would say she would count too. I mean, she started out as being a pampered princess and wanting everybody to kind of wait on her hand and foot, but then she became, you know, the leader of this army. And she finally, and she was one, it was a strong female character who had to kind of learn how to be a strong female character. Right. Because she had to kind of learn how to put other people's needs before her own. Yeah, because she was raised as an imperial princess. She <laughs> she was used to everybody putting her needs before anybody else's. But once once she learns how to, you know, put her own selfishness aside, she became, well, she became the queen that she was destined to be and a pretty good one mm-hmm. for the most part. She made her mistakes, but, you know, she was able to bring the army that helped basically form a distraction so that Garion could sneak in and do what he had to do. Right. So I would say she's pretty heroic. Well, you know, her distraction also ended up being a little bit more than a distraction, but... Well, you know... It was only supposed to be a distraction. It turned out being quite the major campaign, but it worked. (laughs) But anyway, so yeah... Like I said at the beginning, these these type of characters have always drawn my attention. And whether it was ones that I read when I was a kid or ones that I've read further on as an adult, I just, I find them just really impressive. And most of them, you know, kind of gives you, give you an idea of things to, to learn from. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'll notice that neither one of us picked uh, Bella from the Twilight books. Um, no. Because, no. That is not the ideal example of a strong female character. Not even remotely. 
I'm going to sit around and mope for months because my boyfriend... The boy I like doesn't like me back. He, he left, and I can't see him, so I'm just going to sit here and be miserable. Really? Yeah. No. I mean, seriously, in the book, the lapsing of time is shown by pages that just have a month title on them where she does absolutely nothing. And then, you know, since that's not enough, that's not helping, let's go drive a motorcycle off a cliff. Yeah, see, it, it almost scares me, the number of, well, girls and women who find anything at all appealing about Bella's character. <laughs> Look, I will freely admit, yes, I enjoyed the Twilight books when I read them. That does not mean that I liked Bella and did not want to slap her silly. Yeah. I mean, I've I've read all of them. I own all of them. but And I, I enjoyed them. They're, they're pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, the definition of fluff, mm-hmm. as we were talking about last week. Which, again, there's nothing wrong with fluff. You can enjoy fluff once in a while as long as you don't make, you know, a complete and total diet on nothing but fluff. But, yeah, she was she was one of the ones that it was a good thing that she was telling the story because if she was another character that wasn't telling the story, I probably wouldn't pay any attention to her at all. No, probably not. In that sense, since I didn't really like Bella in the book, then, you know, Kristen Stewart was okay to play her because I don't really like Kristen Stewart either. <laughs> Mostly because she has one facial expression. I'm a better actress than she is. Yeah, it's, it's, she was kind of the definition of just the one-dimensional female character. Definitely. There, there was there was no depth to her whatsoever. And then when you compare her to somebody like Clary Frey from the Mortal Instruments series by Cassandra Clare, who is also, you know, has feelings for, an, a very strong feelings for another character in the book that even kind of goes into a love triangle kind of thing between, yeah. you know, she has feelings for Jace, but then she also has the strong friendship that could be something more with Simon. But she's such a little spitfire. Mm-hmm. And even though she doesn't know what's going on with the shadow hunters and fighting demons and then her mother gets kidnapped or attacked or something she doesn't even know what she just goes out there and goes with it and she doesn't like it when people are trying to keep her in the dark she says forget that i want to know what's going on i want to figure out what i need to do to get my mom back yeah and you know okay yeah jace is over there and he really pisses me off but i also really like him you know she doesn't let that stand in her way. Well, you know, when Jace goes through those phases where he, like, you know, doesn't want to talk to her, doesn't want to be around her, she doesn't sit and mope over it. No. She's like, okay, she's... if you're going to be a jerk, I have other things to do. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna move on with my life, and I'm going to focus on the things that need to be focused on. Yeah. And, I'm you know, I'm going to go save my mother you. from my crazy father. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. So you just sit there and stew in your own juices while I go do this, okay? <laughs> instead exactly. of instead of sitting around moping about it. Exactly. So yeah, let's just let's just see here. If, if I was going to pick somebody to be a role model for, say, my daughter, would I go Clary Frey or Bella Swan? Yeah, that's such a tough decision. <sighs> yeah. What? <laughs> totally Clary Frey. Come on now. Absolutely. All right, and the girl who's playing her in the movie coming up looks like she has more than one facial expression, so that's good. We can be thankful for that. I'm like... (sighs) All righty, well, we have been talking about this for quite a while, so I think we should probably wrap it up. But I'm sure that in future episodes we will continue to talk about really strong, awesome female characters just because we really like strong, awesome female characters. Yes, of course. (laughs) So any time that we read a book that has one, we will talk about it quite a bit. And so if you have any really strong female characters that you admire, uh, please tell us about it. Uh, We would love for you to email us. You can do that at bibliophiles.podcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter, and you can find us at bibanonpodcast. Yes. And so you can send us tweets. You can email us. You can also check in at the tavern. We have a thread 
there where a lot of people have already mentioned some of their favorite female heroines. So I guess female heroines, that's redundant. Their favorite (laughs) heroines. I've mentioned that I'm tired, so just, yeah. Roll Um, with it. Roll with it. And so you can join in there, and if there's any that you see there that you agree with or if there's any that we've missed, um, let us know. Add them in there. Yeah, we'd love to hear it because I know there's so many more that I would love to talk about, but we kind of our own time restraints here, so I can't go through all of them. Oh, I could talk about this topic for hours, yes. and I'm pretty sure no one wants to hear that, so <laughs> we're going to keep it to what we have now. But anyway, next week, we have kind of a different topic, I think, um, that Jess come up with, and we're going to be talking about what draws you to read certain books. Uh, We're going to talk about whether, you know, it's a book cover that you see or whether it's knowing something about the author's previous work or maybe it's the blurb on the back. But what is it that makes you pick up a book and decide to read it? I think it's an interesting discussion. I think so, because I think it's different for different people and I think that it's different for different books, too. Yeah. So if you want to... um, give us any kind of comments on that topic as well send us an email send us a tweet however you want to do it and we will read some of those on the podcast if we get any interesting ones yep and as always we'll pull some from the tavern too absolutely okay so i think that that's everything i think that covers it all right so until next week we'll talk to you then bye bye